Good morning. Do you hear me? Okay. Good morning, everyone. Perfect. So, um, I, my name is Shen Ling Chen. I am an associate research professor at Institute of Law, Academic Seneca, and I also co-direct the Information Law Center. The Information Law Center is very happy to have this opportunity to co-host this event this year. And um, now I'll put on my other hat as a Gov Zero contributor. So I've been part of this community since 2014. And uh, my background is actually in law, not in tech at all. But in, since 2002, I've come to know and cl um, collaborated with technologists on various digital rights issues. And that is to say, I have become one of those techno-political nerds that our keynote speaker talks about in his 2018 book, The Rise of Nerd Politics. So I'm extremely excited and honored to moderate this session and to present to you our keynote speaker of today, Dr. John Postil. So Dr. John Postil is an anthropologist based in RMIT, that is Royal Melbourne Institute of Technology in Australia. He specializes in media, communication, social political change. In his 2018 book, The Rise of uh, Nerd Politics, he talks about the rise of this group of people he's, who he calls techno-political nerds. And I'll let him explain to you what they are or what we are in his coming talk. And this class of people as a new political brokers that have growing political influence. And in his 2024 book that just came out weeks ago, The Anthropology of Digital Practices, he talks about the um, anti-woke movement as a major actor in the contemporary cultural wars. And in this talk, he will explore the, uh, some, some links between neuropolitics and the uh, global cultural wars. So without further ado, I'll give you Dr. John Postil. Many thanks for that uh, wonderful intro, very concise. That sums up qu quite a few of my first slides, so that helps us move along quicker. Uh, that's the title there, Nerd Politics and the Global Culture Wars. And what I'm trying to do is to connect those two books. Uh, just mentioned the, the book about nerd politics and the one on culture wars. And my next step is from now to try and go beyond the Anglosphere on the topic of culture wars uh, and work towards a sequel uh, of the culture wars book. So what I'll do is I'll build on the previous work on technopolitical activism and then on the anti-woke movement to explore the links between nerd politics and the global culture wars, following individuals and groups at uh, the intersection of nerd politics and those global, in inverted commas, uh, we're not sure, I'm not quite sure how global the culture wars are, are, but they seem to be becoming more transnational, more globalizing on issues including uh, race, gender, health, geopolitics, and or climate change. There's no shortage of issues. Obviously, at the moment, it's the Gaza, the Israel-Palestine issue, but there is no shortage of issues that become transnational very quickly. So let's talk briefly about nerd politics. The term is not mine. I borrowed it, so to speak, from the digital rights activist and author, uh, Cory Doctorow, who wrote a piece in the, in the Guardian about the problem with nerd politics and how technopolitical activists, uh, essentially technopolitical activists are people who like to mix their technology with their politics, how they should engage with formal politics. And it was quite prescient because that happened, started happening in places like Iceland, Spain, Taiwan as well. Uh, there was that connection to formal politics, which hadn't been there uh, until the early 2010s. So who are you calling a nerd? Uh, the people I'm calling for now, but this will have to change, I think. For now, I've been calling a techno, uh, tech poll nerd a pro-democracy, pro-democracy, I repeat, political actor, individual or collective, operating at the intersection of technology and politics. 
and I'm using it as short for technopolitical nerd. Now, it wasn't my work alone. There was quite a lot of work that inspired me uh, back in the day when I started looking at this in 2010. There was Gabriela Coleman's, Coleman's book on Anonymous. There was Heather Brooks' journalistic work, uh, The Revolution Will Be Digitized. Uh, Chris Kelty, the anthropologist, wrote about the free software movement. I'm sure many of you will be familiar with Kelty. Uh, but I always tend to add that book by Chatwick, The Hybrid Media System. I think I should start charging Chatwick royalties for promoting his book because I always insist on the idea that we shouldn't forget the legacy media, that radio, television, even print media are still around, they're still important. Uh, we heard yesterday how in, in Taiwan, TV is still the main source of political content for most people in Taiwan. So let's not forget in all this talk about social media and so on, let's not forget the legacy media. I also worked, uh, I, I learned a lot from PhD work by Kubitschko and um, other uh, candidates, other PhD students on Germany, Brazil, uh, case, case studies from different parts of the world. So that's, that's what happened after fieldwork. The, the book came about following fieldwork in Barcelona with a group that I believe some of you have links to, the uh, Xnet group in Barcelona. This is back in 2010, 2011. I did uh, long-term fieldwork, anthropological fieldwork. I was at events, uh, now historic events, like the Free Culture Forum in Barcelona in 2010. Um, and at the time, if you remember, in, most, in a lot of the Western world, there was the so-called global financial crisis. It wasn't that global. It was affected mostly countries in the West, like the US uh, or Spain or Iceland. So there's a lot of social protest in many of these countries. And in Iceland, for example, one of the early case studies was a lot of uh, news we were getting and, and some research on how people in Iceland crowdsourced the new constitution via Facebook and Twitter following the collapse of the economy. And of course, uh, I, um, I then turned, after having done fieldwork in Spain, I worked uh, long term in Indonesia, mostly in Jakarta, on the digital rights space in Jakarta. I came to the RightsCon event in Manila in 2015. Some of you may actually be in the room in that picture. Uh, so I followed mm, digital rights activists, journalists, other, other types of political actors connected to this space. That was the, one of the slogans at the time, protecting the open internet and defending digital rights of its users. And my research in Jakarta, I worked with different groups, including the, uh, the Digital Democracy Forum, Papian Voices, or Kawal Pemilu, the, uh, the election guardians that some of you will be familiar with. There's a chapter in that book on digital Indonesia where I go in, in some detail with my colleague Kurniawan Saputra, we'll look at the the Indonesian digital rights space. So in the book, in the Nerd Politics book, I borrow from research from other people as well. I try to give case studies from different regions, and a, these are some of the participants, some of the examples that I give. You can't really see it um, because of some <laughs> formatting issue. That should say Gov0, and V Taiwan. Those are the two Taiwanese examples. Somehow the, it's come out, crossed out. But there were, there were a couple of uh, uh, examples from Taiwan. Uh, as part of the chapter, there's a chapter on formal politics, how uh, nerds, technopolitical nerds, get involved in formal politics. So what did the tech poll nerds actually do? Uh, back in the 80s, up until the 2000s, they did mostly two things, digital rights and data activism. And the, the boundary is quite fluid. You know, someone like Edward Snowden, you could say he was doing digital rights, but it was also a form of data activism. And more recently, from the 2010s onwards, we see two new spaces, the space of social protest and the space of formal politics. First, it was social protest, the Arab Spring, the Indignados in Spain, the Occupy movement, the Sunflower movement here, the Hong Kong protests. And then in some cases, it, those same people, some of them became involved in formal politics. One unexpected finding from that work 
is that each space of nerd politics had its own democratic ideal. I didn't see that one coming. Uh, now it seems a bit obvious looking at it with hindsight, but digital rights was very much about liberal democracy. Sound, sounds a bit like a quaint idea these days. Um, data activism was monetary democracy. It's the ability to monitor what the powerful are doing, what powerful governments, powerful corporations are doing via uh, data, databases. Then social protest was very much more about that idea of the assembly, of occupying public space, physical space, and uh, that being the democratic ideal. And formal politics, more, more about participation, how to use not only technology, but also social uh, practices to increase participation in a democracy. These were not only hackers, they were, I like to call techno-political activists clampers from the acronym CLAMP. Uh, so they came from different skills, skill sets. C for computing, L for law, A for art, M for media, and P for politics. You can't simply be, form a group of highly technical people if there are no political legal skills as part of that group. They're very good techno-political actors, are very good at working, at having a core team that grows a crowd around it. So very much through crowdsourcing, crowdfunding, we see a lot of these initiatives in, in different parts of the world. They also do lots of strategic part nerdships, what I like to call part nerdships, whereby it's not just nerds, it's also, or, can I say ordinary people, non-nerds. It's also non-nerds who take part in many of these campaigns, many of these activities. Uh, it can't just be nerds. That's one thing we know from the various case studies. The people I was looking at were against authoritarianism. Now, of course, we have to open up, <laughs> from what, because of what's happened in the recent years, we have to take into account the anti-democracy actors, which I don't, in, my, in the book, I don't really look at the anti-democracy, but that's something I intend to do in, in my upcoming research. They are not just techno-utopians, they are pragmatists as well. They, uh, they take their, their, their work very seriously. Uh, they mix utopian ideas about digital democracy with the realities of the frustrations of both technology and politics. And they're also rooted cosmopolitans. They're not just free-floating in cyberspace. They are generally rooted in one place, in their country of birth or country of residence. Uh, although they're very cosmopolitan, they, they spend most of the time working within a, a given uh, political culture. I have a short uh, piece online on the fourth space of nerd politics. For those of you who haven't got time to read books or don't bother buying books, uh, someone mentioned earlier, the, um, you can read it there online. Okay, so let's talk about uh, the global culture wars. Does that mean there that I've got 19 minutes left? Oh, excellent. We're doing quite well. Let me just grab some water. I thought I would be spending two hours on the first bit. Okay, so let's get to the global, cultures, global culture wars bit. Uh, back in the early 2010s, in the US and other Anglophone countries, what we saw is the rapid spread of critical social justice, what some people pejoratively call woke ideals, norms, and practices. I'm using the word woke here descriptively. I'm not making a, any value judgment about the word woke. I just use it as a short form for critical social justice activism. And the English language became in inverted commas, woker during the 2010s. Terms like microaggressions, white supremacy, etc., became mainstream through the New York Times, academia, and so on. Black Lives Matter was launched in 2013 by three radical black queer women in Los Angeles. And in 2014, we had two very high-profile police killings of black men in the US. Uh, you probably remember the cases of Michael Brown and Eric Garner. Uh, and this, according to some of the research, more research is needed, but among many white liberals, this was a, meant a turn towards social justice ideals, decolonial ideas, uh, uh, not so much among um, 
other ethnic groups in the US, it was mostly a white phenomenon uh, among white liberals. And these ideas were spread, as I said, by the New York Times, the Guardian, media like that. Uh, that's an example from 2010 in the wake of the George Floyd killing in America. What I didn't realize, oh, that's been crossed out. Uh, my, my invented word has been crossed out, but that word should be not postmodernism, but postmonerdism. Uh, postmodern nerdism, there is a Within the digital rights world, we've seen more influence, more of these ideas having an influence, ideas to do with inclusion, with diversity, uh, because this is a wider phenomenon of the liberal, liberal spaces becoming, turning more towards social justice, critical social justice issues. At the time in the book, I call it inclusivism, um, but it's basically that idea, social justice uh, ideas and practices. And the... One good example was the Internet Freedom Festival. We used to be, it used to be held in Valencia in Spain. I believe it hasn't been running since COVID. And uh, the way they describe their own work is as one of the largest, most diverse, and most inclusive unconferences in the Internet Freedom community. So these ideas were coming through uh, as they did throughout the wider society. And these ideas, of course, are not just confined to the U.S. They, uh, they circulate transnationally. Uh, I'll give you a, a couple of examples. Uh, the group called Guacamaya in, uh, in the Global South in Latin America, hacktivists from Latin America, who are quite similar to Anonymous. They support freedom of expression. They're concerned about the surveillance systems of private and governmental institution, institutions on citizens. They do quite a bit of doxing. Uh, among other tactics. That's one of the, uh, the artwork from the group. Not a lot of research has been done on the group. Uh, if someone wants to do a master's thesis or a PhD thesis, I think it's well worth it. Um, what the, the, the hacking operations uh, are against the, what they regard as the exploitation of indigenous lands in Mexico and Central South America, but they also have a connections to activists in Europe and other regions. They critique uh, neo-colonial projects of the global north, and they, the language is, is quite postmodern or postmodern nerdist. Uh, the use of feminine nosotras instead of nosotros uh, in Spanish. And according to Byron Escobar, the articles are probably written by young people with a university education, middle class presumably, drawing on feminist theory, highlighting the negative consequences of patriarchy. So we can say it's, it's, it belongs to one of the two big camps in, in, the, in the culture wars. Now, recently, Gabriela Coleman, who I mentioned earlier in connection to research on Anonymous, the anthropologist Gabriela Coleman, has written this really interesting piece on Anonymous and QAnon. The, what's the connection between Anonymous and QAnon? In 2011, Many of you will remember that uh, Anonymous was scheming, and I quote, on internet relay chat rooms and scoring victories in the media after major hacks. Uh, this was happening on 4chan, which is a new microculture that was evolving in its own distinctive ways. They already had politically incorrect and racist speech at the time from, from the early days of 4chan. There was a board the, the innovation happened when this board called POL, Poll, was created for, in inverted commas, discussion with a politically incorrect bent. Users would discuss news and ideology, and they bring to those discussions reactionary racist interpretations. Now, you'll be familiar with Gamergate. What happened in 2014-15 was this online harassment campaign targeting women in the video game industry. The attacks were attributed largely to white, male, right-wing gamers who rallied against the rise and influence of women and feminism in the industry. Gamergate was a turning point, was a milestone in the evolution of the online culture wars because it served as a recruiting tool for the growing alt-right movement and helped spur the online Pizzagate conspiracy theory, which uh, soon became the wider... QAnon conspiracy movements. So a lot of these later phenomena or developments can be traced back to Gamergate. 
Uh, according to Gabriela Coleman, Gamergate was a crucible of the populist online wing of a much broader transnational. I've, I've added the transnational. It, it, again, it wasn't just confined to the US. Transnational reactionary right movement. The main enemy of these people were the so-called SJWs, the social justice warriors, and the secondary enemy was the mainstream media. The burden of far right treated the mainstream media as a key conduit for SJW, what today they would call woke views. Back then, uh, the acronym was often SJW. Now, there's a really uh, intriguing research recently by Michelle Cho, uh, Cho at uh, Toronto on this connection between QAnon and K-pop. Uh, this piece, this, that's from a talk that I strongly recommend on, as you can see, anonymous QAnon, TikTok teens and K-pop fans, ecologists on internet populists. Again, it's the transnational dimensions of these things that I think need to be taken more seriously. This particular case study started with um, uh, Alexandra, sorry, AOC. Well, uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, AOC, the New York Congresswoman, who tweeted about how K-pop allies had... Um, flooded the Trump campaign with fake ticket reservations and, as you can see there, and tricked you into believing a million people wanted your white supremacist open mic enough to pack an arena during COVID. So this became a high-profile case in the media for a short while in which you had uh, K-pop fans and others using TikTok to campaign against Trump. Very transnational. It used, um, uh, we could, going back to my earlier schema, it, it, it's, you could say it's within the, the realm of formal politics. It's both the culture wars, but it's also nerd politics, and it's an intersection. Uh, a Breitbart story, the right-wing platform Breitbart, uh, wrote that AOC praised teens and Korean pop fans for allegedly using Chinese app to meddle with the Trump rally. This was, according to Cho, attempted to deflect attention from the low attendance at a Trump rally by feeding its readers a chain of terms with negative associations. Uh, Breitbart declared AOC a security threat, touting her compromise interests. So what they did is that they linked all these really negative sounding to a, a, a US audience foreign markers, China, Korea, uh, in, uh, as well as AOC, to attack teenagers and K-pop fans. Despite the disconnect between the allegation and the evidence, the rumors about K-pop fans uh, having all these anti-Trump leanings spread very widely, and they created a, a, two conflicting images of, of K-pop fans. On the one hand, they were seen by one side of the culture war as a force for collective good, but the other side of the culture war saw them as using the, the old trope of a yellow peril in cybersecurity discourse and right-wing propaganda. So again, a good example of the intersection between popular culture, uh, nerd politics, and the culture wars. Uh, there's quite a lot of imagery there. For example, these K-pop activists used these images, as you can see there, donators, Twitter awareness, petition makers, uh, references to BTS and K-pop stands. Uh, you can see there on the right, Anonymous coming out of his hibernation, and the world coming together to take down the police and racists. Now, uh, Michelle Cho very kindly cites my book on nerd politics. Uh, she says that this synthesis of Twitter and offline publics into the same social justice battle was enabled by a coalition of unlikely, um, by, a, by a strategic partnership with other political actors. So some of them were very nerdy, other people, uh, other participants were ordinary uh, citizens, plus you had the other side, you had the backlash from the transnational alt-right. In my own research, I've been looking for the past few years for my sins. I've spent a few years online, not 
your typical anthropological research on the ground, talking to people, has just been lurking for the past few years, following these people called the intellectual dark web. Hands up if you've heard the term intellectual dark web. Some of you here, some people haven't heard uh, of the intellect. Most people haven't heard of the intellectual dark web. How can I sum it up? I know, I'll write a book about it. It's, uh, they're quite hard to sum up. They are podcasters, YouTubers uh, of a certain age, middle-aged, mostly white. Some of them are, are black and from other racial backgrounds. And what they have in common is that they see themselves as, um, don't laugh now, but I mean, there is some truth to this. They see themselves as classical liberals uh, fighting for uh, freedom of speech and anti, they see themselves, they don't always ex uh, accept the term anti-woke, but they're against the rise of social justice activism, against the rise of wokeness. Uh, they're very, they're transnational within the Anglosphere. It's not just Americans, there are other ang uh, Anglophone actors there. And what they decry is first the rise of wokeness and second, the liberal progressive consensus in academia, the media, and the corporate world, which will probably remind you of what you, we just said about QAnon uh, being against both social justice warriors as well as the mainstream media. We saw this very clearly during COVID and Ukraine with lots of conspiracy theories. But what happened with COVID and Ukraine is that the anti-woke movement, the intellectual dark web was divided between those who went towards more conspiracist positions and those who stayed quite normy, quite mainstream, and were attacked for being mainstream. So there's, at the moment, there's a, there's a schism within the anti-woke movement, within the intellectual dark web, web, between those I call conspiracists and the, the consensualists, those who try to follow the scientific consensus or the establishment consensus on, on Ukraine. That's an example from uh, the Joe Rogan podcast, Joe Rogan is the guy on the left, said to be the, the biggest podcaster in the world in terms of audience, and then he's there with uh, Jordan Peterson, the Canadian psychologist, who's uh, it's become a bit of a guru, especially to young men, and to the right, Brett Weinstein, who um, became very active in the COVID space with, um, as an anti-vaxxer. Now, another important figure within the anti-woke movement is Elon Musk, who went on the Joe Rogan show. They did some smoking together. And Elon Musk has declared, has, is, is very much a culture warrior. He sees himself as defending freedom of speech uh, against political correctness. And he's recently declared AI as the Culture War's new frontier. Well, the, the Guardian declared it, interpreted it that way. But uh, Musk has, for example, launched uh, Grok, uh, his anti-woke chatbot. Chatbot. So you could say he's operating, if you'll excuse my association of Musk with the digital rights world, in a way it, it is what he's claiming is that digital rights are under threat by the rise of um, wokeism that he's fighting to, to liberate that. He's also close to political figures. So he, Musk also operates within the formal politics space, again, at the intersection of nerd politics and culture wars with the uh, Argentinian president, Javier Millet. Uh, they're both, as you can see there from the Financial Times, they share the love of free markets in the first meeting. Now, in the book, uh, on digital rights, I talked about one of the characters was um, uh, Greenwald, Glenn Gr Greenwald, who was uh, connected to Snowden through the, that famous Snowden uh, leak of 2013 of uh, US mass US surveillance. More recently, Greenwald has moved towards uh, more, well, he's very hard to classify. But um, some people would put him on the, on the ho horseshoe theory of ideology, whereby on certain issues, the far left and the far right tend to uh, agree. On, on the issues of Ukraine and on COVID, we've seen quite a few similarities between far left and far right positions 
in questioning the mainstream consensus. And Greenwald has moved towards there. He's spent quite a lot of time uh, on Fox News when he's discussing US issues, whereas in his, he lives in Brazil. In Brazil, he still has more of a left-wing persona. Now, to finish this very tentative presentation on where to go next with this research, I'd like to mention an article by Ayub and, and sorry, I can't, Stuckel. Uh, Ayub and Stuckel have this uh, article on uh, the double helix entanglements of transnational advocacy, moral conservative resistance to LGBTI rights. This is not about digital rights, but I think it's very relevant to the discussions we're having here uh, on digital rights and technopolitical activism. According to these authors, most of these transnational networks have a reciprocal relationship. They have to navigate each other's presence in an interactive space and thus uh, uh, using related strategies uh, for mutually exclusive ends. They, they look specifically at gender, how, how central gender has become in contemporary world politics. And they call it a double helix because we can't just study one camp in a, in a culture war or in, a, in an ideological conflict. We need to study the interactions between those who are for LGBTI rights in this case and, and, and against. So they, the case study is the International Organization for the Family, where they follow some of the key actors. Uh, for example, you have Alexei Komov, who is Director of External Affairs of the Russian Orthodox Church, and Teresa Okafor from the Foundation for African Cultural Heritage. These are all uh, political actors who are part of transnational networks promoting uh, anti-gender ideology, anti-LGBT or feminism uh, projects. And in future research, I think, and this is what I'd like to discuss with you here, uh, I'm guessing there must be transnational uh, techno-political nerds who are caught up in all kinds of double he helix entanglements on various issues, including within the digital rights space and here in Asia Pacific. So I think we need to pay more attention to those interactions between people who are for and against digital rights um, activism. And I'm sure many of you have a lot of experience with this. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Dr. Postil. We have one question on um, Slido, as I know. Can you show that? Oh, several now. Okay. Well, we don't have a lot of time. Why don't you pick one or two you want right. to get to? Right. Um. It's early days. There are questions about Musk, more information about uh, Musk involvement. I, I don't, the answer is I don't know yet, but I do intend to look at this. Uh, it's my first... I, I've written one or two things about Musk, but what I can say is that his presence on X, on Twitter, is, as we all know, he's highly influential in terms of audience, and he's very much aligned with... Uh, various anti-woke public figures. Uh, is the content misleading? Sometimes it will simply be taking an, uh, an ideological position. Some of that content may not be fake. Um, I'm, I'm not suggesting Elon Musk is, is putting out fake content. What I'm suggesting is it's coming, he's coming to these debates from a very clear framing of the issues and, and anti-woke framing, quite explicitly anti-woke. Uh, so I'm not sure how much of that will connect to discussions on, on fake. Not everything should be about fake news and disinformation. We need to talk much more about framing. And we need to accept that there will be progressives and conservatives. So um, this will be part of the discussion in any political culture. There'll be progressives and conservatives. Uh, the one at the bottom there, how do you think uh, about polarization of political correctness? I'm a feminist and a survivor myself. Sometimes I find it difficult to discuss about it with friends. Yes, this is... I was just recently in Spain and in Peru doing some research, and it is a big issue within left 
wing progressive spaces, uh, this, the trans issue has been incredibly divisive. And um, it's, uh, it's something that I always find there's a big difference between a public, <laughs> we talked yesterday about public versus private. Uh, uh, what people are prepared to talk, discuss in public is very different from what they tell you in private. So people have concerns about how polarized the whole trans debate has become. Uh, are Jenny very worried to do it publicly? Uh, so this is something that needs, needs a lot of work within the, the progressive circles, because of course the right are using these uh, inner debates uh, against uh, progressive actors. And uh, how we, are we doing? We can get, we can get to one, uh, ten, one more. Ten, yeah, one more. One more. We okay. have to finish at five past. Cu okay. So culture war is generally a negative term, unproductive and necessarily hostile conflict. What makes nerd politics particularly vulnerable to the culture wars? Well, so far it seems to me, but this is something I need to look into. I think so far, for example, the digital rights space seems to have escaped uh, a lot of the culture wars. Someone is nodding there. You're not... Um, uh, I think inevitably there will be conflicts. If the moment you start proposing a more inclusive, uh, um, uh, a more inclusive uh, social justice approach, there will be some backlash from, uh, from more conservative right-wing actors. Now, It's, so there, there is that vulnerability, the more progressive spaces within digital rights. And uh, that's all I can say for, for now, but more research needed on that. It's a very good question. Well, thank you very much for the insightful talk. You have three questions for us. I'm sure you want to have some feedback. So if any of you have any thoughts, please come to him and tell him what you think about the last three questions. All right, so please join me to thank Dr. Postel.